Chapter 17 The Secret of the Key Dune waited until Trog's snore was steady, Skogo had stopped whimpering, and everyone seemed soundly asleep. He sat up. Holding on to the chain so it wouldn't make a noise, he swung his legs off the side of the couch. He took off his shirt, and then his undershirt, which was made of old, soft, limp cotton, and he wrapped the undershirt around the chain, stuffing it into the cuffs around each of his ankles. Cautiously, he moved one foot just an inch. No clink. He put his shirt and jacket on, stuffed his scarf in his pocket, and stood up. He took his light cap from the floor, folded it around the candle, and put it in his other pocket. Then, with one tiny awkward step at a time, in total darkness except for the faint glow in the window from the low fire down in Harkin Square, he moved toward the door. There he paused. All was silent, except for the sounds of breathing and snoring. No one had heard him. He thought of the diamond in the closet. He had the strong feeling that the diamond was like a child stolen from its rightful parent. It needed to be rescued, and he was the one who should do it. The risk would be tremendous. If they heard him and stopped him, his chance for freedom might never come again. He had told Trog that he was not a thief. But the diamond was meant for the people of Ember. He was sure it was. So really it was Trog who had stolen it. Should he try to get it right now? He could hardly bear the thought of leaving it behind. But if he tried for it and was caught and lost his chance for freedom, then what? Standing there in the dark, he weighed these questions for several seconds. He chose freedom, finally. But in the back of his mind, he held on to a hope that he might return somehow and get another chance at the treasure that should be his. He turned the knob of the apartment door. It opened soundlessly. He went out and shut the door behind him. He sat down on the top step, and then, one soft, silent bump at a time, he went down the stairs on his seat. At the bottom, he paused again within the shadow of the doorway, looking out into the square. There was Minnie, sitting with her back to him, in a big armchair by the fire with a stack of short sticks by her side, and one long stick in her hand. She gave the fire a poke, and a few sparks flew up. Then she sat for a while without moving. Dune waited. Some minutes later, she reached down for a chunk of wood and tossed it on the fire. The flames caught it and danced a little brighter. Dune leaned against the stairway wall, determined to wait as long as it might take. It wasn't too long. After ten minutes or so, Minnie's head began to dip. It dipped down and jerked up. Dipped again. Jerked up. Finally, she lost the struggle. Her chin sank toward her chest. Dune saw the curve of her bony neck. Then she began to snore, a weak, sniveling snore, a sort of bubbly whine. Now! Dune stepped out onto the pavement. He made his way toward Minnie, inch by inch. It took a long time. Once she stopped snoring and sat up, Dune froze. But she only poked the fire feebly and slumped down again. Beside the fire, a few yards from her chair, the forks and knives and pots and pans from last night's dinner lay scattered on the ground. Barely breathing, Dune crept up to them. He chose the smallest knife. He slid it away from anything it might clank against and picked it up with two fingers. Then he moved on toward Minnie. Another dozen microscopic steps. He had to stop once to tuck the undershirt back around the chain when it began to come loose. Finally, he was standing behind her. Now. If his guess was right, this was the moment when he would know. It was her nervousness that had given him the clue, especially the way she had an attack of it every time she came near him. He had noticed that her hand fluttered up to her throat, 
that she clutched at her chest, that she skittered away from him. Was it because she had the key? The dim firelight glinted faintly on the knob of greasy hair at the top of Minnie's head. Dune bent as close as he dared, holding his breath, peering at her bare, scrawny neck. His heart leapt, right so far. Against the tendons of her neck lay a string. In one swift motion he lifted the string from her skin, cut it, and pulled it away. And yes, there was the key. Minnie stirred. She slapped at her neck and muttered. Dune, gripping the key, took a step back. If Minnie woke now and saw him, it was all over. But she slumped down again and resumed her snoring. Dune backed up a few more steps, then bent over and fitted the key into the lock that held his chain. The lock opened. He unwrapped his shirt from the chain and pulled the chain, one careful link at a time, from the ankle cuffs. Just as he was straightening up to run, a chunk of wood in the fire dropped with a thump and a sizzle of sparks. That was the sound that brought Minnie awake. She sat up. She groped for her stick. Dune, standing only a few feet behind her, froze. If he moved now, she would turn around and see him. With her stick in her hand, Minnie stood up and took a step toward the fire. At the same time, with great caution, Dune took a step backward. Minnie pushed at the fire, moving the embers around. But as she did, Dune stepped back farther. He had to reach the buildings and get out of sight, hide himself in a doorway before Minnie turned and stay there until she fell asleep again. He thought he had managed it. He'd gone far enough to feel a wall at his back when she turned away from the fire, and she didn't look up as she went toward her chair and sank into it. Dune got ready to run. He'd go back to Greystone Street to pick up his pack, and then he'd head for the path that led up and out. His legs itched to get going. Then Minnie, having done her firewatch duty, seemed to recall her other duty. She raised a hand and patted her neck. She straightened up. She patted more quickly. She scrabbled at her neck with her fingers, pushing her hands under her collar and slapping at her chest. With a low moan, she sprang to her feet. Frantically, she peered at the ground around her chair. When she spotted the dropped chain behind it, she let out a piercing wail. Oh, help, help! she cried. He's stolen the key! He's escaping! She grabbed a couple of pans and clanged them together. Bang, bang! The trogs would be jumping from their beds. Before Dune could form a thought, he heard their thumps and voices overhead. Running was impossible. He'd be seen and chased. So he ducked into the nearest doorway, the one next to the Trog's apartment, and pressed himself back into the shadows and held still. It was no more than a minute before all three Trogs thundered down the steps and out into Harkin Square. They'd thrown coats on over their nightshirts, and their shoes were unfastened. York was in the lead. His hair stood up crazily. "'Which way did he go?' he yelled at Minnie. "'We know which way, Dunderhead!' Trog shouted. He's heading for the exit. Fan out, all of you. You too, Minnie. We'll all go toward the path, but take different streets. When you see him, give a shout. He turned back toward the building. Dune flinched, but Trog wasn't looking in his direction. Scargo! He shouted. Get down here and mind the fire! Then the four of them raced away. Dune took a long breath. He would have to find his pack and then hide somewhere until the trogs gave up their search. That might take a long time. Disappointment drained his energy. He wanted so badly to get out now. Overhead he heard a sound, a scrape, then a pause, then a scrape and a thump. A moment later, uneven footsteps on the stairs next door. Kabump, kabump. Dune peered from his doorway and saw Skago come out into the square. Dune! Skago whispered. I'm here! Dune whispered back. Skago limped over to him, going as fast as he could, carrying something. I heard you get up! Skago said breathlessly. And I watched you from the window. Then she yelled, and they all left, and the house was empty, so I got you this! He handed Dune a small, yellow-wrapped bundle. Take it, quick! 
Dune's heart leapt. He knew what this was, but he hesitated. You'll get in trouble, he said. No, I won't, said Skogo. He'll think you took it. He smiled and handed Dune the bundle. Thank you for getting my treasures, he said. Dune laid a hand briefly on Skogo's shoulder. I'll be back for you. Then at last he ran. At top speed, with the metal cuffs bouncing and scraping against his ankles, he ran up Gilly Street, around the corner onto Rock Bellow Road, and then into the deep shadow at the back of the gathering hall. Light from the fire shone faintly along the side streets, just enough to keep him oriented. First of all, he must find his pack. He had to have his generator, left behind when he was captured. He moved as quickly as he dared in the darkness, keeping his mind focused on exactly where he was. He drew his hand along the wall beside him. He counted the doorways. When he got to where he thought he'd left his pack, he swept his foot around in all directions, and at last he bumped against it. He grabbed it up, put the bundle Skago had given him inside, and slung the pack onto his back. His hands were sweating, and his heart was going so fast it was more like a rattle than a beat. He gave himself a moment to think. He couldn't go toward the path, because the trogs would ambush him there. He'd have to wait for them to leave before he could get out of the city. But it occurred to him that he didn't have to waste that time hunkering down in a dark apartment. There was something much more useful he could do. He would head for the pipeworks.